Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the Taking Control of Your Diabetes podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, Steve Edelman. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, good to be here with you, Steve. Always great to look deeply into your eyes when we do these podcasts across <laughs> from each other. So this, this uh, episode, we're going to be talking about diabetes technology, which is a hot topic, and I'm glad to say it's a hot topic for type 1 and type 2. Um, everybody with diabetes is using this technology now. So specifically, we're going to dive into continuous glucose monitoring, um, you know, hybrid closed-loop systems, pumps, all that. But we wanted to give a little bit more of a historical background to start with, um, starting with CGM, kind of the evolution of why we're using it, where it came from, all of that. And, you know, Steve, maybe you can get us through, you know, we don't have to go like super down memory lane, but, you know, <laughs> He's going, warning me. going from, you know, urine testing to blood sugar testing, and then we'll, you know, we'll get to CGM. Yeah. Well, when, when it comes to history, Jeremy always turns to me. Um, <laughs> you know what? Uh, as you know, I was diagnosed in 1917. It was urine testing. And believe it or not, Jeremy, urine testing all the way through halfway through medical school which was 1980, you know, peeing on a That's stick, crazy. Yeah. a glucose stick and ketone stick if you needed it. And in the very beginning, we had that little a chemistry set where you put the little tablet into a test tube, 10 drops urine, five drops water and, or, or vice versa. And it was, and to think about this, it, it didn't give you a number. It just gave you, you know, you had a little bit, you had a medium, you had a lot, and you held it up to a color code, and you were supposed to adjust your insulin. You never did. Mm -hmm. Your doctor gave you your dose every three, four months. You never changed it. So why would you test? They told me to. <laughs> <laughs> you just wouldn't do anything with the information, right? Well, yeah, you, you bring it in, and, you know, sometimes it was still wet from the urine. No, it wasn't. But, you know, we typically... When you came in to see your doctor, you went to a clinic, they draw your blood, and he pretty much made a decision on that one blood sugar in the laboratory on that one clinic day. Plus, if you had your logbook, you'd have plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. It, Jeremy, it was Just bad so news. bad. And, I, I, and I'm not, this is not to get sympathy, but I did have many years of high blood sugar. And um, probably the cause, not probably the cause of some of my complications today. So... And then, you know, and then the early 1980s, you know, home glucose monitors came out. And even when they first came out, you had to put a drop of blood on your on a strip, wipe it off after one minute, and then hold it up to a chart. And, and I'll just say that the thing that really bugs me about that time period, all the endocrinologists, not all of them, but a lot of them say, hey, that's too much information for patients to get. Don't yeah. tell them what their blood sugar is. So... What was it like getting your first blood sugar meter? Do you remember that? Were you excited? Were yep. you like, I can't wait? Like, did you uh, go to a store? Like, what did you do? You know, it was like getting my first CGM or your first CGM. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, you get an actual number. And, you know, we didn't know if it was accurate or not, but who the hell cares? You got a number. And it was, you know, you put a big drop of blood on a strip. You waited exactly one minute. Then you wiped it off. And then the second minute, you stuck it into a machine. Mm -hmm. The AccuCheck, as I remember, and they had other ones too, but yeah, it was just amazing. It changed things around. I remember I was working at the Joslin Clinic as a fellow, and every patient lined up four times a day to check their blood sugar, and we put it into a book, and then we adjusted their insulin, you know, their NPH and their regular. You mean they would walk up to like a window or something? And, yeah, yeah. Well, that they're... wasn't a window, but okay. it was like, but they got in line, okay. and there was a bunch of nurses and us fellows, and they got their blood sugar check, and the next person. And so when, as a fellow learning how to be a diabetes doctor, we would have four numbers a day, pre-breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. And you made your adjustments based on those numbers. And it was a huge advance. Do you, did you ever do finger sticking? Of course. <laughs> but, I, um, meant, I meant, sorry, urine testing. I, meant to I never did urine, urine testing, but you're, you're reminding me. So when I was diagnosed in 94, when I was in the hospital, I remember them using that meter where you had to wipe it off. Sure. You know, yeah. and then... Thankfully, when I was discharged from the hospital, I got like a one-touch basic meter, and I didn't have to do the wiping thing. You know, you drop a big, fat drop of blood on this thing, and um, it would take, I think, a minute 
to give a result. And God, it felt like an eternity. And, you know, test strips everywhere. And then, you know, the worst is when after 60 seconds, it would say error. You'd have to do it again. And man, that, and like, you needed a lot of blood for those. Yeah. You know what? It's, you just mentioned something that brought up a memory of test strips everywhere. The used test strips. Mm -hmm. Where do you put those? And <laughs> I usually just put them back into the little case, but they'd fall out. No, I just had them loosey goosey in my like little zipper thing. So every time I would like open up to test, like I'd lose three or four. It was pretty gnarly. And then sometimes I would actually, you know, drop them on purpose. I felt <laughs> like uh, Hansel and Gretel. You know, they they dropped the little clues so they yeah. could be saved later on. <laughs> and I just figured I'm Steve, a diabetic. Just follow the test strips. <laughs> I wanted people to know it, and I would drop them at places. You know, that's terrible. <laughs> So, all right. So, but you made a really good point about the perception at the time that in the, in, from endocrinologists, I suppose, yeah. like, oh gosh, like we can't give diabetics this information. They're going to take insulin and they're going to be low all the time and crashing their cars. And, and that's something that we'll come back around to is the same exact thing we heard when continuous glucose monitors got approved eventually yeah. is you can't have people getting their information all the time. I mean, which is insane because diabetes is all about knowing what your blood sugar is and All the how, time. Can, how can that be a bad thing? But it speaks to kind of the paternalistic nature of medicine where like, you know, patients shouldn't know they're, you know, be adjusting things. That's me to do. I'm the doctor and I'm important. The patient doesn't know what they're talking about. But as we know with diabetes, you've got to change things on the fly all the time. Yeah. So just more information is it really is power. And I think seeing a number, whether it was uh, the first blood glucose meters or CGM, which now we can see trend arrows, that's a whole different level of sophistication, is that we, no one ever adjusted their own insulin uh, and because you couldn't do it with urine testing. So that's opened the door for that. And look what CGM opened the door for. Uh, this whole concept uh, of this metric we call time and range. And glycemic variability, standard deviation, coefficient of variation, uh, and we can get an estimated A1C now. I mean, it has revolutionized the way we take care of people with diabetes. So tell us about that. So, you know, when your first CGM was like that you actually put it on you and what the buildup was like, were you like <laughs> jumping up and down for that too? Or like, tell us about that. Well, you know what, Jeremy, it was uh, 2006. Yeah. So that's 20. 22 years ago, something like that. Not quite, um, but yeah. I, I just remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> no, 2006, 17 years. About. 16. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you know, long time ago. But I, you know what Anywhere I remember? 16 and 37 years ago. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I remember, uh, you know, consulting with Dexcom because they're located in San Diego and um, you know to actually get a blood sugar every five minutes was amazing and now they didn't even have trend arrows way back then what was the device because I was never on that device it was a short-term sensor it looked like a oval uh, handheld uh, monitor it was dorky it was thick and it had a screen and you know you know we have the we have the handheld monitors now with so I had the 7 Plus, the oval one. So I think this was this Dexcom. It looked the same. The same. Yeah. It, it only looked the same. last three days. Yeah. And it just, you had to calibrate it a couple times, right? Yeah. And it just probably wasn't <laughs> that, that accurate, I'm guessing. You know what? Uh, I would say definitely not compared to the ones today. But I remember uh, going to Hawaii with my family and having it on my body and I, you know, I was a little self-conscious so I put it on the upper part of my thigh uh, under my bathing suit <laughs> and they, at the time it wasn't waterproof but I, I sort of didn't read the instructions and I still went into like a hotel jacuzzi. Uh, I'm not a big ocean guy but I did definitely get it wet and it, it, it continued to work but you know what, it was the first one and it had lots of issues but you got to start somewhere. And did you, so... From when you put that on, did you continue to wear a CGM or was it kind of just like, oh, let me try this and then you threw it oh, away? I, you know what? I have worn one. So case. even with its like shortcomings, it was a huge deal. Huge deal. And Jeremy, I, I don't think I've missed more than one day in those 17 years yeah. because uh, I've I become so dependent on seeing the numbers on a regular basis. Yeah. And I, 
we both talked about this earlier today about when we used to prick our fingers seven, eight, nine, ten times a day. Yeah. Not every single day, but if you really wanted to be tight and, and all the little black holes on the sides of your finger. And I don't even have any now. Yeah. Because I don't test that much, you know, anymore. Just you know, rare occasion. How about you? Well, you're, just, you're reminding me now, you know, that when I was in college, yeah, I mean, I would check, I would say at least 10 times a day, you know, or around there. But like, you know, I want to know what my blood sugar is. I mean, you think about it, 10 times, like knowing it 10 times a day actually isn't that much, you know, but like it was a pain to do it. And I remember going to this one pharmacy because this guy like cut me a deal and to get a hundred strips was about a hundred dollars. Maybe, oh, you know, and so I'm God, using man. that every 10 days or so. So it's $300 a month as a college kid. You know, I just, I didn't have that money. Um, so I remember really stressing out about like, you know, can I buy these? Because they weren't covered by insurance. Um, so it was just a mess. And who knows what happens when you're sleeping. Uh, Jeremy, I, I used to say this to people when they thought they were really proactive testing four to six times a day. I said, you know how many minutes there are in one day? Do you know? So you'd shame these people that were... Oh, totally. <laughs> 1,552, something 1,440. Like okay. And Eric can check my math. <laughs> and, and if you know what you are at one point in time, like you like you do when you prick your finger, you know, you're know you only a fraction of that day. So even people were testing 10 times a day, which is, which is considered a lot. Um, your control was probably not bad, I can say, but... It just really is a drop in the bucket when what's happening 24-7. Well, I remember, I don't think I would have admitted this, but I, I would intentionally try to make myself hypoglycemic. I would take probably more insulin than I needed because it was one time of day that I would know what my blood sugar was. I'm low. I can feel it. I don't need to test. And it was almost slightly like reassuring um, to just kind of ride low. And, you know, this is when you met me and I always had, you know, half drink, you know, Coke bottles and things like that. So, tons um, of them. Because I would just kind of just constantly keep myself just above being low. So if I had a CGM to go back and look at, you know, my A1C was always okay, but gosh, I would have been high and low, just all over the place. Um, yeah, your time below range was, yeah. was probably excessive. But you know what? That's how you did it. Um, and you were successful with it, with the tools you had at that time. I, mean, I survived, you know, and that's, uh, to be honest, like when people say, gosh, I'm so worried about my kid going to college next week. I'm like, you kidding me? You know, like I did it like on regular and MPH and, you know, testing my blood sugar. You did it on urine testing. We yeah. survived. Yeah. I mean, maybe didn't like have the best blood sugars, but with today's tools, like you can just be so much safer. So let me, so you got yours in 2006, your first CGM. I got mine in 2010. And it was actually when I met you and we're going to do a whole video, which might be available when this podcast airs of actually reenacting that day that I met you. Long story short, I had to, I was doing my, my residency training at UCSD, had to go meet Steve to talk about this topic that I wanted to do a, a talk on. And so I went to meet him in the VA clinic and it was just pandemonium with all kinds of people around residents and Steve, you know, just being the center of the show. And <laughs> That's Steve, not true. Yeah, of course it is. Have you met you? Um, so then, um, you know, you, we didn't talk about what I wanted to talk about at all, which is completely fine. You met me and said like, Hey, you have type one, like, you know, what kind of pump do you use? Oh, I don't use a pump. I use regular MPH. You just, you know, lost your mind. You asked me if I was on a continuous glucose monitor. I had no idea what you were talking about. Yeah, that, that, That's when I lost my, you, then know you lost your mind and you just, yeah, just, it was a pandemonium. Then you were just roasting me in front of everybody. It was, I, you know <laughs> what? You always say that, but, um, I, maybe it came across that way and I apologize, but well, you know, you came in, you're, you know, resident, can be chief resident. You're going to, you're going to give a lecture on the history of type one diabetes. And yeah, my time was tight, much tighter back then. And best time to meet people was during clinic, you know, when the people were presenting. And then when later on, when you told me you're going to go into cardiology, that's when I really lost it. <laughs> and thank goodness I, I talked you out of it. Yeah. Well, my therapist says I'm almost over it. Like three more, <laughs> three more sessions and I'll be good. Um, but anyways, so during that meeting, you said, let's get you on a continuous glucose monitor. And it was pretty quick. Like, you know, it was this that guy, Ken, that was, you know, the Dexcom rep. Yeah. You set me up with him. He came and met me. Um, I remember putting it on my, my stomach and it was, it was a game changer. You know, so I was on this, it was called the seven plus. I think then it might've lasted like five to seven days, maybe seven days. Yeah. Seven, seven plus. Yeah. That's probably why they call it that. <laughs> um, and you know, I had some issues, like it fell off, like whatever, but I was just like, this is a total game changer. And I'll say that not only was it a game changer for my blood sugars and just having like inside into, you know, 
my glucose. It was also a game changer in how excited I was about diabetes. You know, that there's this stuff going on, you know, CGM, pumps, all this stuff. Like, there's actually stuff we can do now. So, I mean, that that's my own personal story that I, you know, was, was cool about it. But yeah, just being able to see your blood sugars was was incredible. Yeah, you know what? I don't I don't remember Jeremy um, any of the metrics on the downloads that we have today, and I don't think they were available actually. When I think about it, I don't even remember trend arrows. But at some point, they did get trend arrows. They had trend arrows for sure on on the receiver. <laughs> I don't remember a. You could download it for sure because I remember I sent you my numbers. No, you could. You definitely could. And they, but it wasn't my, as good. My numbers were pretty good. Um, because I, I was really, I knew you were going to look at them and I was like, well, geez, I better like try to tighten this up. And I, I, I impressed you, I guess, with my blood sugars. But anyways, so that was 2010 and it was pretty shortly after that, that I got involved with TCOID, maybe the next year or two. And you, you know, initially had me kind of do some talks on technology, on CGM and, you know, pumps and stuff like that. And I remember very vividly doing some of these early conferences, specifically this one in Sacramento, which is my hometown. And I got up and did this this talk for type ones on continuous glucose monitors. And back then you really had to like sell people on what it was. This is a sensor, you know, it measures this interstitial fluid and it sends it to this reading. And, and it's important because you want to see what your blood sugars are and, and all that. And after talking about all these benefits and showing people my device, people were just angry that they couldn't get the device. They said, yeah, you know, we've heard about this. Like, uh, we can't get it through our insurance. Um, like, basically nobody had access to this this technology. Um, well, do you, let me interrupt for a quick sec. Do you remember we used to start off the, the session by saying, how many of you folks are on mm-hmm. continuous close morning? It was like, out of maybe several hundred people, it's like maybe 10%. Yeah. And now it's the opposite. Totally. It's like, yeah, who isn't? Yeah. So sorry to interrupt. No, but I mean, that was just my take. And I was like, wow, like, and and I think because it was still viewed as like fringe, like, you know, like kind of fancy technology that is just either dangerous, um, too much information or just unnecessary. Um, and And there wasn't a whole lot of clinical trial data at that time around it. But of course, you know, over time, we know that it, people's blood sugars improve. They have less hypoglycemia. Their quality of life improves. And over time, this has become, you know, more accessible, still not as accessible as it should be. But especially back then, like it was just, it was kind of heartbreaking to, to see people just have such a desire to, yeah. to use these things and they couldn't. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's unfortunately, there are a lot of ignorant physicians out there at the time. There still are today, much less, but they, if they don't know about it, they're going to poo-poo it. Mm-hmm. And if it takes uh, fighting with the insurance company, what we call a prior authorization, many of them take the path of least resistance, say, you don't need it. Just just prick your finger. I don't think there's a single person on this planet that likes to prick their finger, yeah. whether it's once a day or 10 times a day. So there was a lot of ignorance. And I think, you know, Jeremy, unfortunately in our society, anything that's new gets push, gets a pushback. Any new theories, any new therapies, you know, so I mean, it's it's just part of the part of the natural history yeah. of these. And you got to remember that diabetes was really, and it has been, kind of leading the way in terms of these wearable technologies in medicine. Period. You know, they, it's not that common that you have something on your smartphone, for example, that has a real true medical device that people are constantly interacting with. And I think because of that, it was just again viewed as you know, kind of some accessory that would be kind of nice. Yeah. That, you know. Someone said to me once, oh, you, you have a great toy. Yeah, so This totally. is not a toy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at look at you. I mean, you got an Apple Watch that has your blood sugar, alerts and alarms, uh, you know, and I have it on my phone. Yeah, I, I keep gotta, trying to get you to get an Apple Watch. I'm just going to give you one and you're no, never going to take it off once I give you one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then for me, and, and tell me if you agree or not. So that you know, I was in the seven plus in 2010, and then there's all the de- the new generations. For some reason, they went back to G4, and then G4 Platinum, and in G5. And for me, the next big breakthrough, I would say, was the G6, which was around 2018. And the biggest thing there was that you just didn't have to calibrate it anymore. You literally did not have to prick your finger anymore. Yeah. Um, which was insane. You know, I still, I hear people say like, gosh, it was hard for me to let go of pricking my finger. I'm like, not me. You know, like I it was the first thing I was just like, great. I don't have to do this anymore. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's how uh, confident they are in the, in the CGM device. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got people who still double check their CGM, you know, four or five times a day. 
and they drive themselves crazy. They do. It's number all by one. 20 and you know this. And, and number two, they drive me crazy. <laughs> um, and you know, the, it, you can't really compare them. You know, they can't. You don't expect to be exactly. Plus, there's trend arrows. There's lag time. Anyway, I mean, people have to feel comfortable doing yeah. that. Oh, I. You know what? Uh, there, I could go six months without pricking my finger. Yeah. No, but I think everyone listening that uses CGM should know that if your symptoms don't match the number, the CGM sensor can be off. Mm -hmm. And it's always good to have a meter, you know, in case your CGM goes down or, or, you know, I had a bad sensor the other day and it was just terribly off. I I pretty much just dumped it because it went bad within the first 24 hours of putting it on. And that's probably the time when they can go, go wrong the most common yeah so once you get past that first second day if it's if you're cruising you're cruising you know and i, I remember around this time i saw a patient in the hospital um about 20 year old kid or so newly diagnosed type one and we were able to get them on a dexcom in the hospital and i remember thinking gosh this person could essentially go their whole life without checking their blood sugar i mean of course they're going to every once in a while but what a game changer you know to like as soon as you're diagnosed, you're on this device. It's just, it makes me feel like a dinosaur in a good way. Like, you know, remember we had to like prick our fingers. Remember, to, like, it just sounds antiquated now. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's amazing to me that they can skip all the crap. <laughs> yeah. And then they get a CGM their first 24 hours. I mean, there were pediatricians, and they, I, there probably are some today that say, oh, a CGM uh, is not really for you. Let's Let's wait three or four months. I mean, you get newly diagnosed with type 1. You're in the ICU for diabetic ketoacidosis. Your life gets turned upside down overnight. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they're saying, you got to watch what you eat. You got to take three or four injections a day. And by the way, you got to prick your finger and look out for highs and lows. And to me, there's every person with newly diagnosed type 1 should get a CGM like within the first 24 hours. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, there are, there's been some great advances, Jeremy. We should talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, you, you pick one, I'll pick another one and we can do yeah, it briefly. So, you know, here we are in 2022 and, you know, uh, CGM keeps evolving. So, you know, Dexcom, we have the G6 right now. The G7 has recently been approved in Europe, as Steve is well aware. And um, it, it hopefully, <laughs> we had a debate about that earlier, um, will be approved here in the U.S. very soon, potentially when this podcast airs. I mean, who knows? Like, this is kind of like an any day situation. And they, they, they keep improving. It's going to be smaller, more accurate. Um, the warm-up time is, you know, 30 minutes. You can actually overlap sensors so as one is expiring you can put on the other one so there's actually no downtime you much have, smaller much you know continuous readings smaller and um i think super cool the transmitter and the sensor are together in one thing so there's no more separate prescriptions for the you know the this sensor and the transmitter and all that so, yeah i mean and and you look at the libre the libre started off uh and still continues as a what they call intermittent scanning you got to take the reader or your smartphone scan it over the sensor and it gives you a number it gives you a trend arrow it brings in all the numbers over the previous eight hours but now uh, uh also available in europe is the libre three now it's approved available. in the states yeah there you go yeah and that reads a glucose every minute and you don't have to scan anymore so that's a huge jump up i think for the abbott a series of CGM devices, yeah. and it's it's got a better form factor. It's smaller. the de The insertion device comes as one, and so it's got and it's more accurate than the previous versions. And they are waiting for approval to be hooked up with insulin pumps. And yeah, we'll talk about hybrid closed loop systems, but the Libre Three, I think, is a huge uh, advance compared to the Libre Two and the and the fourteen day Libre, which all have the same form factor. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, as far as are these devices helpful or not, that debate is over in type 1 diabetes. It's the standard of care now. We know these devices improve blood sugars, you know, reduce hypoglycemia, all of that. So what that means is that it's it's getting easier and easier to get these devices into people's hands. It's covered by insurance. Medicare approves it, even like Medi-Cal and things like that. But we're still having that debate a little bit in type 2 diabetes, um, where, you know, is it helpful? Who needs it? Is it people just on insulin? Is it everybody? Um, right now, um, these devices are generally approved for people with type 2 diabetes that require mealtime insulin. 
So if you're listening and you're on mealtime insulin, for God's sakes, get out there and ask for a continuous glucose monitor um, because your provider might not bring it up. It's still, you know, viewed as unnecessary um, in, you know, type twos. I think in the very near future, it's going to be available for everybody with diabetes and potentially other you know, people that just want to know what their blood sugars are, elite athletes, these kinds of things. The sky's the limit. Um, but thankfully, we're, we're getting it available for more and more folks. Yeah, no, I, my, my personal feeling, Jeremy, you sort of heard me say this before, but I think uh, CGM is applicable at all st- stages of a type 2 diabetic lifespan, from mm-hmm. pre-diabetes, where you really have to make an impact on what you eat, how much you eat, and exercise, all the way to oral it, medications only, oral plus one shot of basal insulin to what you mentioned in multiple daily injections. But the, the, and I think that's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. I think one important thing I wanted to say is that, you know, it, it's not like you slap on these things and your control gets perfect. Right. We've seen people, even in the clinical trials, you know, you were talking a little earlier today about going from 60% time and range to 70, 10%. Well, you know, 68 to 70% is good, but why not 80, 85, 90%. And I think you would agree that you can get to a certain level with these devices and then you can get much better depending on how much an individual puts into it, Mm -hmm. how much they pay attention to what they're eating, where they set their alerts and alarms, if they understand what the trend arrows mean. So I think the sky's the limit for the degree of control, but I think it's just important for people to realize that, uh, you know, you have to engage with the numbers of the CGM. Right. And what I, another thing I think is really cool about CGM, so in general, when you look at the clinical trials, type 1s or type 2s, you put a device on somebody, you train them, they can lower their A1C by 0.5%, half a percent or so. And that varies, of course. Um, but I think that's awesome because the CGM is just providing information. You know, it's not um, giving them a medication or anything. So people are learning from these devices, they're changing their behaviors um, and getting better results. Yeah, yeah. And, and I talked about the metrics earlier, but... You know, I, I believe uh, the glucose management indicator, also known as the estimated A1C, more accurate than the lab. And really, if if you think about it, we don't even need to get the A1C anymore, but we still do. Insurance companies don't even know what CGM stands for, other than, you know, reducing their, their yearly profits. No, I'm sorry about Constant that. Constant goose, uh, goose monitoring, what did I say in that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my but, um, you know, I, but I think that the other thing is we now have choices. Yeah. So we talked about the Dexcom, we got the Libre, and then there's the Eversense E3, which is an implantable sensor. You know, after a 15-minute office procedure, uh, the sensor stays under your skin for six months. You wear a transmitter over the skin, on the skin outside, and the information goes to a smartphone or a smartwatch. So this is an individual who may want that form factor, others who are in the water a ton, others that don't want to deal with getting your insurance refills, you know, the sensors, the transmitters. So it's once again, one size doesn't fit all. And it's nice we have choices. They're yeah. all they all have pros and cons. No, I'm just thinking if you could go back in time and meet medical school Steve who was running to the bathroom to pee on a stick and show him, you know, your CGM, he'd be like, Get out of here, science man. You know, like future <laughs> dude. Like I mean it's just it's it would seem inconceivable. Um, and now we're just talking about, oh yeah, you can have this option, this option. And like so we have come a long way. And and the slope of these changes is is gone up dramatically. Or it used to be like something would change once every 10 years. Three months. Yeah. Now it's just every, yeah, three months, like there's something new. Jeremy, you know, you you just said something that reminded me, running to the bathroom. Well, back when I was younger, you weren't even born yet, um, hush puppies were very popular. The shoes? Yeah, the shoes, hush puppies. And they were suede, Yeah. you know, like a light brown suede uh, with a a leather strap on the side kind of. But if you're testing your urine with a test strip at the urinal in school, you know, the urine would splatter mm-hmm. and drip and it would stain my hush puppies. You get little white. Well, they would turn wet. It looked like it was water, of course. And then, then it would like leave a circular mark. Yeah. You just brought back a memory when I was in middle school, Patrick Henry Jr. High, <laughs> San Fernando <laughs> well, Valley. I remember reading stories from Jocelyn back in like before insulin where he would say he could diagnose diabetes at the, you know, kid across the hall because with black shoes, there'd be little white spots on the shoes where he would, you know, accidentally pee on his shoes and it would evaporate and leave a little kind of sugar stain there. I, I, um, I never heard that story, yeah. but I, I believe it. But for you, it's your hush puppies. But so Yeah, well, that's why... <laughs> R.I.P. hush puppies. Get, Got to get shoes that don't stain. Yeah. All right, so let's see if CGM... 
um, and talk about pumps a little bit. And again, you know, we don't have to go down memory lane too much, but the story with pumps is that for the longest time, they were kind of stagnant. I mean, they, it was another way to deliver insulin, um, which had some advantages over shots, uh, but that was kind of it. It was, it was patient preference. And even right. five years ago when I saw a patient, you know, I would say you can be on a pump if you want. You don't need to. I don't think they offer like super benefits over shots. And that has changed dramatically recently. Yeah. It, you said it exactly right. It came down to personal choice. It, it, it was a way of delivering insulin. You, you, you had your basal rate, which took the place of the basal insulin. And then you give yourself boluses all based on either finger sticking or continuous glucose monitor that did not communicate at all. Now, we, there is no memory lane when it comes to hybrid closed loop systems because the first one uh, by Medtronic, the 670G, you know, it was just a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, and since then, now we have four choices, four uh, on the market and with different form factors, different type of uh, pumps, you know, and but they all work the same way in general is that somehow the the continuous glucose monitoring data gets to the pump. There's an algorithm that will modulate the basal rate depending on the predicted blood sugar and the insulin on board to keep your blood sugars in range, 70 to 180. And, of course, the, the all the algorithms, Jeremy, are proprietary. Mm -hmm. Like if they told us, they'd have to kill us. <laughs> and that's their that's the secret. Their algorithms are all different. Yeah. So it's don't you think that's the single greatest change in the last half decade for beyond. sure yeah i mean I, I remember again not that long ago eight maybe 10 years ago hearing about the quote-unquote artificial pancreas and if you ask people back then what is an artificial pancreas a lot of them would say well it's you've got to have some surgery and some you know cyborg implantation or whatever and no it's just a cgm and a pump that that talk to each other and i still felt like it was science fiction um, but where we're at today, I, we have multiple systems, you know, Tandem, Omnipod 5, Medtronic has one, um, looping. We can go through those a little bit in detail if you want. But basically, if you're on a pump these days, chances are you're going to be on one of these systems that's, that's, that's modulating insulin. And the biggest benefit of these has been the overnight control. And actually, I remember the first system that I went on was, you know, loop, which is an, a, an FDA-approved device. But basically people, this is maybe 10 years ago, found out a way to hack these pumps to, you know, put these algorithms on it to make them be kind of smart pumps. And the very first um, version of this is that you had to take an old Medtronic pump. There were certain models that worked and you couldn't really find them anywhere. And these things were selling on eBay for like thousands of dollars because yeah. all of a sudden they, they became valuable again. And I had a patient that gave me one. Uh, I was a woman. It was this like bright pinkish, purplish, you know, Medtronic old pump that she gave me, and it only held it held 180 units. And I set it up with Loop, and you know, it worked in terms of like automating insulin delivery overnight. And I remember one of our friends, Ian Bloomer, when I first went onto it, and he said, "Well, how can you sleep at night, like like knowing that this thing is like just controlling your, you know, or giving you more or less insulin?" I said, "I sleep great." You know, like, yeah, um, it's, you know, I don't have the highs. I don't have the lows as much. I wake up in like a good range. I, again, am comfortable kind of handing over that control. It takes some time to get like used to it. Uh, but man, it's nice to have, especially when you're sleeping, something just kind of in the background taking care of stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I think about giving up the control, you have a pretty good safety cushion, your CGM alerts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you got me calling you <laughs> yeah. when I follow you know, your blood yeah, sugars I mean, and you go low. It's Yeah, you have your alert set. So, yeah, if some, for some reason you get too much, it goes crazy, you know, it alerts, you know, you treat it, and then you figure out what's going on. But I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with the listeners. You know, hybrid closed loops have been out for a while, you know, four or five years. I don't know about 10 years ago, Jeremy, for the okay. whatever. Know, you're, you exaggerate a Well, lot. your math is spot but, on. So. But I'll tell you what. I have not heard of a single safety issue with any of these systems. Yeah. Um, and, and patients don't come back saying, I don't like it. I don't, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. They, you know, there have been some issues with defective pumps, uh, but that's a whole different story. But I'm talking about the tandem control IQ, the Omnipod 5, and looping. You know, uh, it, we're just, we, we would hear about it. Mm -hmm. There'd be reports, there'd be FDA warnings, this and that. And uh, you just don't hear about it much. So, you know, these systems really help people with diabetes. Now, just, just give us an example. When, if you were in your clinic 
and you saw, let's say, five, six patients all on hybrid closed-loop systems, describe your experience. Yeah, we talk about, you know, what their favorite burrito is to eat, what kind of exercise they like to do. I mean, it's just the blood sugars are generally well-controlled. You know, people are generally 70% or higher. And there's always things that bother people. Even if you have quote unquote perfect blood sugars, whatever that is, there's always something to talk about, exercise, whatever. Um, but I would say the like air of doom and gloom is kind of like lifted. I think there's just more hope and, you know, people just feeling, I think, better about themselves and their, their future and all of that. I mean, I, I don't mean to be too like over the top, but I think it's just... It's changed the game. Yeah, you know, I, I invited Bill Polonsky to come to my clinic. You know, he's a clinical psychologist specializing in moho- emotional and behavioral issues. And he, at the end of the day, he goes, Steve, your clinic was so damn boring. <laughs> but literally, Jeremy, everybody was on some type of hybrid closed-loop system, and their A1Cs were extremely close to 7 or below. Their time in range was 70% or greater. Their time below range was minimal. Mm-hmm. And there was absolutely nothing to talk about. Now, well, to, yeah. I was just going to say, we have to admit, we live in a bubble. You know, we're here in San Diego, we're at a university, you know, people have access to this. Um, still, the majority of people are not using these systems. Um, so we don't want to paint a too rosy picture. However, the point is, yeah, this, we do. <laughs> this technology is very, very helpful. And if people are seen regular by a physician, they can do really, really well. I mean, music to our ears would be some of the listeners out there would learn something about this technology and ask their caregiver and go out and get one. Yeah. And then I got to brag on you, Steve. So Steve's, um, Steve and I have always been like in a slight competition to, you know, who can get more time and range. And at first I was beating him and I don't know, for the last year at least, Steve's really kind of like pulled away. <laughs> and he set away, set this like new goal for himself to get 90% time and range um, for for 90 days. And if you look at the Dexcom Clarity, you can pick the last two days, seven days, 14 days, 30 days. And just like an hour ago, right? Maybe three two or four hours ago. hours ago. Yeah. You did it. <laughs> 90% yeah. time and range for the last 90 days, which is amazing. Yeah, you know, I, I was at 90% for two, seven, 14, and 30, but the difference between 30 and 90 is two months. Yeah. So it took a while. And uh, one thing that's important to say to everyone, you know, my control always isn't always very good, but I, I did some tips and tricks with setting my alerts and alarms that I'll go over. Uh, on some of our that have gone over in some of our lectures and our big one conference, but um, I haven't done anything that different. Yeah, I haven't said no. You can't go have a cheeseburger. You can't do this. You can't do that. I pay. I might pay attention to the trend arrows a little bit more. Might give myself a correction dose a little bit sooner than I used to. Uh, maybe just be a little bit more careful on trying to avoid huge consumptions of carbohydrates, but I, I, I can't even think about anything that I said to myself, no, you can't do that because yeah. you're going to wreck your time and range. No, and when you texted me that, I thought that was that was big, you know, that this is achievable without just being, you know, a complete saint or whatever. And then he sends me this picture of it says, I'm celebrating. And it's a, <laughs> a plate with like five chocolates on it and still in the wrapper and one chocolate that has been eaten. I'm like, See, you call that celebrating? It was like one chocolate. I was like, go eat like five donuts. Like, you know, like you really need to celebrate. That's insane. Jeremy, I did. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know, my of 90 days, my average 133, uh, the estimated A1C was 6.5, and standard deviation 34, time and range 90, uh, time below range 1%. Now, once again, um, you know, this is a very unusual thing for me. Yeah. And I'm like everyone else. I could, I've had two day time and ranges below 60, you know, and you, as we all know, once you get on that roller coaster, it's hard to get off. Yeah. And so it'll, it'll fluctuate. I'm going to try not to drive myself too crazy to keep it there. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, if I get above 80, I, I'm happy. So well, well, I think you're a great story because as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, you're in testing and one shot a day and your blood sugars were probably 300 all the time. You had no idea. And you do have complications that you've been very open and talking about, you know, eyes, um, you know, things that are thankfully stable, your kidneys. So you're not out here bragging like, hey, look, I'm perfect. You know, my blood sugars are amazing. And what's everybody else's problem? No, you're somebody who's been through the ringer. And you're at a place now that thanks to, you know, CGM and hybrid closed loop that you're kicking butt. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And um, listen, you know, it's never too late to take control of your diabetes. That is the message. So I think, you know, we can probably wrap it up there. It was really nice to take this trip down memory lane. By the way, 
I got a notepad with like notes of what I wanted to talk about. It's completely blank. We just started <laughs> and started talking, and you know, it usually takes us to hopefully a, a enjoyable place for the listeners. So, hope you guys enjoyed listening. Always fun to do it with you, buddy. Yeah, c- come to our website. Uh, send me a note on some of the blogs, and uh, go to the video vault and get get educated. All right, everybody, take care. All right, bye.